place. So to give you an example of, um, of one of these things that we're pursuing today is that with adaptive, the other thing that adaptive optics allows us to do is not only take pictures, which I've emphasized so far because of course it's, not, it's easy to show pretty pictures, but with, uh, with adaptive optics we can now take spectra, which was not possible with speckle imaging where you could only take an, um, an exposure that was a tenth of a second long. Now we can actually integrate uh, for a long enough period of time to get a spectrum. So this is a, um, a spectrum, and what we see in the spectrum are absorption lines from hydrogen and helium. So what an astronomer would immediately conclude from looking at this, um, this little spectrum is that this star is very hot. It's about 30,000 degrees Kelvin. You compare that to the sun, which is only about 5,000 degrees Kelvin. So this is a very extreme star. And when, um, when astronomers see a very hot star, the other conclusion that they make is that it's very massive. And when astronomers see massive stars, they also know they're very young because massive stars are kind of the party animals, again, of the stellar world. They live fast, die young. So if you see them, they're young. Okay, so they're young, and in astronomy, that means, uh, this, in this case, it's uh, less than um, 10 million years old, which really is quite young. It's comparable to the age of this guy compared to us. Okay, and what we know about little baby stars, as, opposed, as well as um, little baby kids, this is one I'm quite from, uh, fond of, is that they must have formed nearby. Okay. Um, and why is this a problem? This is a problem. Oh, and I should have said, that spectrum was of SO2. That's the star that we, that's the closest example of a star to the black hole, and it's young. Why is this a problem? It's a problem because star formation, to get stars to form, you need a big ball of gas and dust to, um, to collapse under its own self-gravity. And what does a big black hole do? Well, black holes have strong tidal forces. So what is it going to do to the, um, the cloud of gas and dust? It's going to pull much more strongly on the side that's closest to us than the side that's more, further, more distant. So it's going to pull that cloud apart, which is naively, we would think, going to prevent star formation, which is why we thought that um, young stars shouldn't exist near black holes. And yet, um, that's what we see. So this has been fun because there's been a whole host of um, solutions that have been proposed um, to explain these young stars. The first um, idea was that, well, maybe these are not old uh, young stars. These are old stars masquerading as youth. Uh, phenomenon we see a lot in Los Angeles, and there are lots of forms of astronomical Botox to make them look um, young. All you need to do is make the outside look hot. Remember, that's the, the reason we think that these are young stars, and there are a lot of ways of doing this. You can um, send these stars near the black hole once they're formed and are um, uh, basically dense enough such that, such that they're not torn apart, and one of the things that's going to happen is that they're going to get heated, but it turns out you have to get much closer than any of these stars um, uh, do to have this mechanism work. Another idea is that you can um, strip the outer layers of the star off. Stars have structure so that the cool parts are on the outside and the hot parts on the inside, so if you strip off the outside, this I guess would be the abrasion technique, they might look hot. The problem with these, this idea is that it's, they are not going to last for very long, and we actually see a lot of these young stars there, so none of them work. Another idea is, well, look, Maybe they really are young, and um, they form far away from the black hole, where the tidal forces aren't so problematic. And the solution here would have to be, you'd have to put these young stars on an express bus, because they really are um, young, so they don't have a lot of time to migrate in from further away um, into, the, uh, into the black hole area. And basically, no one's thought, figured out a way to migrate them um, in quickly enough. So this idea doesn't seem to work. Um, the last but not least is the idea that, look, they're young, and they really did form where uh, we see them. And what does this mean? This means that the environment um, near the black hole had to have been very different when these stars formed than um, the way we see it today, which means that the, perhaps there was a disk of gas and dust uh, which could fragment into these stars. That would essentially suggest that our galaxy was once one of these prima donna act active galactic nuclei in its use, because that, all that gas and dust that um, forms stars would also have to accrete on to the central black hole. So that has interesting implication in terms of the historical um, activity level of our black hole. Now, the future. Adaptive optics is wonderful. It's allowing us to um, see all these stars at the center of the galaxy and to solve these problems. What we need to do, actually, I should go back to this last um, picture here. If this idea is right, what we should see is an imprint, is that the orbits of stars at large distances should all line up into a disk. 
So we want to see stars at larger radii. So um, in terms of pushing forward in the future, one of the things that we want to do is we want to change the adaptive optic system to work not just with one laser, this laser that stimulates an artificial star up in the sodium later. The challenge with, that, with this technology is that that star is not at an infinity. So we don't actually correct all the atmosphere that the starlight's going through. The solution to this is just to add a few more. <laughs> And w with this, this is a system that's in design now, the next generation AO system for the Keck telescope. This should allow us to make much more precise measurements at larger radii to actually probe this idea of whether or not there's an alignment in the orbits at larger radii. Um, even more distant, we're thinking about the 30 meter telescope. Um, this is a telescope that has um, three times the diameter of Keck. It's a rather uh, enormous project. If you think about the scale of the diameter of this telescope, this is um, the size of basically a baseball diamond. Um, it would also have a structure, a dome structure, which would be the largest moving structure in the world. So it poses a number of technological problems. The adaptive system, optic system would definitely have to be one of these multiple laser systems um, because now the diameter of the telescope is so immense that a single laser would really um, be left with lots of uh, residual atmospheric error. Why do I care about this? Well, because I want to get even closer to the black hole than that 15-year period guy allows me. And if I can get to higher resolution, then I get probes of the, of the, of the gravitational field that are, um, that are much closer. It's also true that the orbital period gets um, shorter, which is good for me. As I get older, I'm less patient. So I don't have 15 years um, to go around too many more times. And with this, um, this system, we get down to orbital periods that are only maybe um, three years, uh, which would be phenomenal. This would allow us to do a number of things. First, it would allow us to test uh, black hole and galaxy formation uh, models. Second, and probably um, some of the most exciting ideas, is that it would allow us to test general relativity on a, uh, in a gravity regime and a mass scale that's never been tested before, as well as looking at many of these um, stellar dynamics problems. Um, so in conclusion, I hope that I've convinced you, if nothing else, that we have a definitive case for a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy and that this is now providing us with a wonderful laboratory for understanding the astrophysics of black holes. And to end with, I will uh, end with a three-dimensional um, animation of the orbits. The, the red stars are old, the blue stars are young, and the yellow stars we don't know. So thanks for your attention.